Where do I just on the side. You gotta turn the switch on the on off. <laughs> good evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. We are uh, gonna sing a little bit, as is our habit, and then we will study the Bible a little bit.
remember the uh, truth of that song. When we uh, bring requests to God in prayer that God will make a way. Now, he doesn't always make the way that we would choose at first. If we stay with God and we live long enough, we sometimes see that the way that God made, though difficult at the time, was the right way. Because God never makes a mistake, but he does often not do what we ask him to do. Because we're not God, and we don't see everything, and he is, and he does. And we have to remember that God made a way for Jesus, and that way was suffering. And God made a way for Paul, and that way was a thorn. And so sometimes the way that God makes for us is what he does in us while leaving us in what we're in. And I think that's important to remember because uh, I think we get disappointed and discouraged sometimes because we've labored under some false idea that everything's just going to work out. That being a Christian means being happy because we're just blessed all the time and things are wonderful. There's a lot of reality that says that's not true. Um, we can be joyful and we can rest in knowing that he knows what's best, but he doesn't always do things the way we might have thought. And we need to trust him anyway. So I want to look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, ones that we've been praying for, which remember them, Charlotte and Mary is still finishing up a uh, quarantine as his. Uh, Ginger. Ginger's been out a little bit, but uh, I'm going to say she still wasn't feeling all the way better. Uh, I want to remember Linda Smith and uh, Clarence and Jennifer Law. That's Freddie's sister. She's been to church a few times. She broke her ankle. I don't know how, but she broke her ankle in three places. Um, but uh, we want to remember them, uh, those different ones. And uh, the just uh, ongoing life of our church. We, we want to pray that our church is a place where we see people drawing close to God, where we see people uh, having an, an encounter with God. Mm -hmm. It's my prayer that each of you, and me too, can live through this year, and then at the end of the year, look back and name specifically someone that has been brought closer to God because of an influence that we had on them in some way. Whether it was we invited them to church and they came, whether it was we witnessed to them on our own, whether we helped them in some way in the name of Christ, something, something that we can point to and know for sure that we had some influence for Jesus on them. That's that's really my prayer for us this year. So let's look to the Lord. Father, thank you for uh, your word. Thank you for the way that you watch over us, Lord. We trust you, and we don't always understand. We certainly don't always understand you because you're too great and mighty and powerful for us to ever understand, Lord. But we do trust you, Lord, and we know that sometimes... You change our circumstances, but sometimes you leave our circumstances the same and you want to change us. And I just pray that you would help us to be okay with that and to be uh, obedient to you in those times when we have to walk through some difficulties. I uh, just want to pray for those that are sick and getting over sickness that would like to be here tonight but cannot be. We pray for those that are uh, <clears throat> able to be here but chose not to be. pray that you would speak to their hearts, Lord. I pray that you would be with those that can never be with us, but watch on uh, Facebook that you would especially bless them, Lord, and uh, be real to them tonight as they listen to your word and as they uh, gather in their own place. Uh, we 
because they cannot do that. I pray that you would watch over them. Be their district superintendent, our general superintendents, Lord, and the, the general leadership of our church. Help us as we look to this year uh, that our church would have an impact on the country, that we would have an impact for you, Lord, and that our churches would be places where people find Jesus and come to know him better and become more of the committed followers of him. We ask these things in your name, Lord. In addition, we ask that you would help us tonight as we study your word, as we uh, look into First Peter, and that we would uh, be blessed and edified for the time we spend there. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, I feel like it's been a long time coming to get to this uh, Bible study, but I guess really it's only been a couple weeks. But we are starting tonight in First Peter. We are starting tonight in First Peter, and um, tonight's kind of an introduction. And I, on the uh, handout I gave you on the back, there's a map there which really has no key to it, but those are some of the travels of uh, places that are talked about in this letter. So that's kind of the, the area of the world that is talked about here. Um, in the world of music, <clears throat> and I suppose in other arenas as well, name recognition is really important. If you were hoping to get into the world of classical music, for example, you would take lessons, a lot of lessons, uh, from some teacher. And the more noted that teacher is, the more impressive those lessons will be on your resume. Hopefully, they'll also be better. But the lessons are expensive. And the bigger name, they're more expensive. Uh, sometimes time and distance preclude you from studying with just anybody that you might want to. So the next best thing is to study with someone who studied with someone. And again, in the world of music, this is a thing. That people that they're, people, Musicians tend to be snooty in a lot of ways, especially classical musicians. And they want to be able to tell you who they... Well, I, I, I studied under so-and-so, and I studied under so-and-so. So, you probably don't know this, but I actually, after I graduated from all of that, I went to Indiana University School of Music, the biggest school of music in the world, and it is arguably one of the very best schools of music in the world. I always said that at school, and then one day my principal was, uh, I don't know why that day he decided to give me an extra amount of shade over the, my claims to that effect. But he was saying, you know, something like, oh, this, you know, you, you don't need to brag anymore. You, you know, you, you can say that stuff, but it's not real. And I looked at him and I said, okay, well, I pulled up my phone and I typed in best music schools in the world into the Google search. And I said, see this? Yeah. And I hit search. Boom. Well, guess what? <laughs> There's just such a joy in being right. <laughs> he was like, well, I, I thought you were just like saying that. I was like, no, I wasn't just saying that. So, it's true. One of the best music schools in the world. Often the best. It's one of those things they kind of vote on every few years and it changes. But nonetheless, world class, world renowned people teach there. And then people like me go there. Some world-renowned people go there, but I, people like me also go there. And while I was there, I was, as a music major, you don't just major in music, you have to say what instrument or if you're a voice, you're that major. So if you're a singer, you're like, I'm a baritone major or I'm a tenor or whatever. For your instrument, you say what instrument. So I was a tuba major because that's what I played all through college. So at Indiana University in those days, I studied with Harvey Phillips. That name probably means nothing to you, but in the world of classical music, uh, people that know, they know that name. He is the foremost professor of tuba at the time. He passed away now. 
in the world. He was the first brass instrumentalist ever to be inducted into the Classical Music Hall of Fame. He started Tuba Christmas. He started, he commissioned personally over 80 solo works for tuba. He studied with William Bell, who played in the New York Philharmonic. And so I can say I studied with Harvey Phillips, and people that know about music stuff would be like, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> and if I needed to further that cachet, I could say, and he studied with William Bell, who played under conductors like Leonard Bernstein and George, or not George Sell, but the, the guy that preceded Leonard Bernstein, John Lennon right now. So that kind of thing in music is really a, a thing. We are here in this constant quest to get to know Jesus better. Well, Jesus did not personally write any books of the Bible, but his followers did. We can't study with Jesus, so to speak, so we are going to study with one of his people, Peter. Peter was... In so many ways, Jesus' right hand, right hand man. Would the other disciples dispute that? Well, they might have before the day of Pentecost. But after that, I don't think so. Peter is always listed first in any list of the disciples. Peter was the first one to confess that Jesus was the Christ. He was the first one among the three. So there was the twelve of which he was always listed first. And then there were the three special ones, and he was listed first in those, Peter, James, and John. He was uh, present at the Transfiguration. He was specially tasked with praying in the Garden of Eden, or Garden of Gethsemane, excuse me. Uh, and he, he was there at all these events, and he was just the go-to guy. He was clearly a leader of the disciples. Jesus had given him the name Peter. His parents did not give him that name. Jesus gave him that name. His parents called him Simon. Simon is a, a name that has uh, roots connected to a reed like that would be in a lake. And reeds move. You might say they're shaky. So Simon, who was sometimes shaky, was called by Jesus Peter, which means rock. Because Jesus was speaking a blessing into him and saying, you are going to be the rock. And then he said, and on this rock, which people thought meant him in particular, the Catholic Church thinks that for sure, but Peter was among those that Jesus built the church around. He was considered a pillar of the church. In Galatians 2.9, Paul wrote, In fact, James, Peter, and John, who were known as pillars of the church, recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. So Paul is, I don't mean this in a negative way, Paul is using Peter to establish his own credentials. Paul is, is getting cachet fr from the church by saying, well, I didn't just pick this on my own seat. Peter <laughs> approved of me. Peter recognized the gift God had given me. Oh, well, Peter did that, okay. Because Peter had real significance in the early church. Though Peter had denied Jesus three times, right before the crucifixion, well, he came to Jesus for forgiveness. He was a far different man after the resurrection, and especially after the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. He preached on the day of Pentecost, the same man who just a few weeks earlier, which we're going to be talking about in the next week or two on Sunday morning, just a few weeks earlier, he was 
right there when Jesus was being questioned and a girl, not even a grown woman, a girl said, you're one of those people, aren't you? And he was so concerned what she might say that he, no, he denied Jesus and he cursed and denied Jesus. He didn't, he, he couldn't stand the pressure of that high school age girl. But then on the day of Pentecost, he goes out and he's not afraid now. He stands out in front of God and everybody and he starts preaching. And it must have been a home run, grand slam, because over 3,000 people were converted. 3,000 people came to the Lord. Some must not have. Any others? I mean, it's not for everybody. He preached to thousands of people and 3,000 of them. That church went from 120 to 3,000 in one day. Bam! Peter was on fire. Literally. After a vision, after that, he had a vision and uh, God showed him this vision of this cloth with all sorts of un unclean food on it where God said, hey, take, have some shrimp. And Peter's like, oh, no, 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 no. I, no, I don't eat anything unclean. And God said, no, don't call anything unclean that I eat. <laughs> and it inspired him literally then to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Long before Paul did, Peter was doing that. Paul is the, seen as the apostle to the Gentiles, but before Paul ever started, Peter had done that. He's uh, thought to have been martyred in uh, about 64 AD, and he was going to be crucified. And it's said that he, he asked, would you crucify me upside down because I really am not worthy to have the same sort of death as Jesus. Amen. Jesus had a humil hum humiliating, oh, I can say, a humiliating death, the worst possible shame of being hung on a cross. And Peter said, I can't have anything that special. Because Jesus made the cross something special. So just upside down. Can you imagine being crucified upside down? Can you imagine? The reaction of those that were standing there. How they must have scratched their heads and been like, what? what? It was stuff like that that made the church what it was in those early days. Uh, Peter's letter that we're going to study tonight was actually written as a circular letter. It wasn't written to one church, it was written to a whole bunch of churches and it would be passed around. And we start off in verse 1 of chapter 1. And I apologize, I didn't find out what page it's on in the pew Bible, but it's first Peter, it's toward the end. 1886. Uh, what is it? 1886. 1886. There you go. Thank you. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion, dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, this area, like I said, I showed, I've got that little map on here. That area collectively is known as Asia Minor. Today, that area is the nation of Turkey. Now, on the day of Pentecost, there were Jews present in Jerusalem from Pontus and Cappadocia and Asia. Those ones there on that day could easily have been among that 3,000 that were converted. They were there for the Pentecost, for the festival of Pentecost. We, we need to remember that. To us, that's one thing, but to the Jews, that was a different thing. To the Jews, that was another celebration, another reason to go to Jerusalem. And so there were Jews there from all over the world for that festival, and some of them were from these places, they could have been among those converted. And so then they weren't, they didn't move to Jerusalem. They were there for that thing. And then they were going home. And they took a souvenir home with them. The Holy Spirit. 
And they took him home with them, and then they started in on their own homes. Paul uh, <clears throat> carried the gospel to Galatia in Asia. Uh, now, again, when to Paul, Asia was a small place. It, for us, we think of the continent of Asia. That's not, that's not the same. Same word, but not the same thing. The capital of Asia was Ephesus. So it is a part of that area. Bithynia is only mentioned right there in that verse I just read. It's not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. Now, if we were to go to the very end of the letter, we see more foundational material. You may remember back when we very first started talking about Philippians that I pointed out to you that letters in those days aren't like letters to us. Because of what we write, when we write a letter, we start off who it's to, dear so-and-so. And we write the letter, and at the end, we say who it's from. And they would reverse that kind of thing. So verse 12 of, I think, chapter 5, By Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. That Mark is the Mark that wrote the gospel. Okay? In, this, in these couple of verses, we're told that Peter used an amanuensis. An amanuensis is like a type of secretary that would take dictation. And so uh, he said, that was Sylvanus, our faithful brother as I consider him, by him I've written to you. Okay? So that was not an uncommon thing. Paul used one sometimes, and then sometimes he said, see what large letters I write with my own hand. So he was making a distinction between the time he used the amanuensis and the times he did it himself. We also learned that Peter, along with Mark, is in Babylon. Not literal Babylon, the, you know, in Persia, like Daniel. Not that Babylon. Babylon is what the name Peter used for Rome. And he used that as a description of its spiritual condition. So it's, it's generally held that Peter died in Rome. And this letter is generally accepted to have been written around 62 to 64 AD. And in verse 12, the one I read, that I'll read another little bit here again, uh, we see the purpose of the letter. Again, this is at the end of the letter, but this is the purpose of the letter, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. The uh, commentator that I was reading said that uh, there's a lot of exhortation in Peter, a lot of things where he is encouraging uh, believers to remain faithful and courageous in the midst of persecution and suffering for Christ's sake. It was also written to encourage them that their faith was true. Why would they need encouragement that their faith was true? Because they had some, they had what? They had doubts. How could they have doubts? Well, the same way as we do sometimes. I mean, <coughs> can any of us really say there's never been a time since we knelt at an altar that we didn't have a moment of doubt? Like, is this? I think that's the human condition. And Peter is saying, you are on the right track. What you believe is true. And, and we gather in church to encourage one another and to exhort one another and to cheer one another on. And, and that's why. Um, there's three main themes in this letter that we will eventually explore quite a lot. 
and that is the Trinity, suffering, and holiness. Now, Peter wrote this letter at a time of growing persecution, but not yet institutionalized persecution. In other words, there was a lot of persecution, but it wasn't like official policy just yet. It did become that, but it wasn't just that just yet when he wrote this. And, you know, when we studied Philippians, we tried to see, like, how, how is that letter written to those people 2,000 years ago applicable to us? And I want to do the same thing with this letter that Peter wrote to believers. Believers that believe what you believe. Believers that are part of the same church of which you're a part. The Church of Jesus Christ. How is this going to be applicable to us? Well, in our world today, and now I'm going to be ethnocentric. Okay, I'm not talking about China. I'm not talking about Russia. I'm not talking about the Middle East. I'm talking about our world, North America. We see, for, for those that have ears to hear and eyes to see, we see the beginning of persecution right now. Yeah. In Canada, there are people that are demonstrating against government policy. The kinds of things, the, the kind of demonstration that the powers that be applaud when it's a topic they want personally to be demonstrated against. Then it's peaceful protests, and you can burn the city down and root and lo loot and riot and on and on and on, and it's peaceful protests, mostly peaceful. But this protest, protesting the government, it's an outrage, and the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, has decided he'd much rather be a tyrant. And so they're, they're going after people. They've frozen their bank accounts. And they, were at, and they were empowering the police to go and steal their gas. And on and on and on. And you might say, well, that's not the same thing. No, it's the beginnings of it. It's the beginnings of it. Because when you have a government that doesn't like to be criticized, and uses the force of government to still criticism, well, then the next thing is the next thing they don't like. And we were talking in Bible study last night, also in Canada, about a pastor in Canada who was arrested any number of times because, well, he had the crazy idea that people were going to church. Well, the government said, you can't go to church. And he said, yeah, we can. And they did all sorts of things to try to shut him down because they were going to be obeyed, not that pastor and not God. Now, I don't say that to alarm you. I look at that and I feel differently about it these days. It used to be I would be very scared about that and be like, oh no, I don't know. What, what am I going to do? Well, now what I'm going to do what I'm hoping I'm going to do is trust in God and, and just trust that better people than I have been led through these kinds of things by God in the past and are in heaven to tell the tale now. Mm. And so as we see the beginnings of that stuff, we can relate to some of the persecution that they were experiencing that they were kind of at the beginning, now they were already past where we are but they were kind of at the beginning of institutionalized persecution and we would like to say it's not going to come here but we can't say that with any certainty um, so let's see alright so back to verse 1 again Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
grace to you and peace be multiplied. So <clears throat> Peter is identifying himself as an apostle. The word apostle means one who is sent out. And in the early church was always and only someone who was an eyewitness of the resurrected Jesus and someone who was personally commissioned by Jesus. The group of apostles is a limited group and it is an unrepeatable group based upon the early church and how they used the word. Peter's authority as an apostle was never questioned. Paul's was. Peter's wasn't. Everybody, Peter, they knew him. He was the guy. He was the rock. He knew, though, that uh, his being an apostle was because of Jesus. Peter knew that any authority he had only came from the one that had sent him because that's how that worked. Some, some faith traditions today will call their leader the apostle so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Is that sinful? I don't guess. It's not accurate. They're not an apostle. <laughs> they can say that, but they're not an apostle. The, there, there are really 12 of those. There were the 11, I suppose 13. There, were, there was the original 12 disciples. You take Judas out, disqualified himself. So they had 11. They added Matthias in. Now they're back to 12. And then Paul. And that's it. Those are the ones. Those are the, the, the ones to go around and plant and spread the early church. Uh, Peter addresses this letter to the elect. He said, uh, verse 2, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God. Uh, so that word elect, does that mean a certain group of people foreordained by God before time to be saved? Is that who that is? No. No. That's not a New Testament concept, by the way. Implying that, uh, implying that a, a, a a group exists that is a group of people that were foreordained by God before time to be with him would then by definition imply that there's another group not in that group that was foreordained by God before time to go to hell is there anything about the New Testament God is there anything about the Old Testament that would lead one to believe with any authority that you could say, see this passage here, this is where you'd say, God created that person for <clears throat> one purpose only, and that's to go to hell. If that's true, then Jesus was a little misguided, wasn't he? <laughs> or was he just lying when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that Whosoever believed in him should, and but God didn't. Say, he wanted everybody. Jesus said that I wanted everybody, but they wouldn't all. So that's not what he means. He doesn't mean that. Um, the New Testament, when it talks about the elect, you need to not stop with that word. The New Testament sees the basis of election in Christ. You're elect in Christ. Uh, Jesus calls to everyone, but not everyone accepts. The ones that accept his call come to God and are elect in Christ. God calls, but we have to answer them. I, <clears throat> I had this experience today. Another reason why I like teaching at Christian school. I'm getting their horns out. These are fifth graders, and they're about 10. Mrs. Burke, you're a pastor. Can I ask you a question? Okay. If, what, how did she say this? If God loves everybody, why did he why did he make the devil?
And so we had a discussion about that. And I said, well, and, and so then there were two or three kids who were like, well, it's because of and I said, okay, that makes good sense. And we, I said, just ignore them for a minute. Let's just, I said, well, that's not really what you're asking. What you're asking is, why did he not make it so that everybody would love him? Is that what you really want to know? Yes. And I said, that's a good question. I said, I have a daughter that lives my house sometimes. When she's at home, most of the time, I don't see her. She'll come in, she'll say hi, and then she'll go to her room. And she will come out if she needs to go to the bathroom or if she wants to eat. But mostly I don't see her. And I'd like to see her more. I might like for her to sit with me in the evening while we watch a movie or some such. And I could force her to do that. I could compel her to do that. But if I did compel her to do that, it wouldn't be that much fun. Because we both know she really didn't want to be there. And that's why God doesn't make you love him. Because he loves you. But he wants you to love him. Now he just made you do it. What fun would that be? It wouldn't be fun at all. So he gave you a choice. And God will never force you to do that. And he doesn't force anybody. But the ones that accept, they are the elect in Christ. They aren't the elect, period. Oh, they were one of the special groups. No. They're elect in Christ. How did I come to God? Through Christ. That's you gotta have the whole thing, the whole bit. Okay? Um, Peter writes to the pilgrims. That word pilgrims in the New King James is also translated as sojourners or strangers. Strangers. Okay. He's making the case that Christians will basically always be, if they're truly in Christ. Strangers in this world. Strangers because we are here temporarily passing through. I, we sang those two old-timey songs tonight. We could have sung, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Because we aren't, that, that makes us strangers. The idea that we think that way makes us strangers. It makes us not like other people in that regard. People that don't have any time or feeling for God at all, you don't really hear them talk that way. Man. Just passing through, no, they don't really say it. They say things more like, you know, you only go through life, you only go through life once. You only go once through life, so you got to grab all the gusto you can. That's an old PBR commercial or something. Um, but that's how they look at that. But Christians are different. Uh, we are temporarily here. We are looking to the next life. And because we follow the teachings of the Bible, and the world does not, we can expect to be misunderstood. We can expect to be thought of as strangers. We can expect to be persecuted because we don't do things the way the world does. And again, the beginnings of persecution, we're not going to have a discussion tonight about this, but let me just point out to you, in the last year and a half, you if you don't, didn't see the elements of how thought control will work, you weren't looking. Because in the last year and a half, there are some things you can't even question. You can't say your own opinion about COVID unless your opinion matches the party line. You can't say your opinion about a mask unless the, your opinion matches the party line. And how dare you? You can't say it online. Well, you get tagged. Your Facebook posts can get removed or your Instagram posts can get removed. So what is it really that hard to believe that if someday might come where that talk about the Bible, you know, I mean, that, that talk, the Bible's against home, homosexuals, so you can't have that on there. It's not hard to believe. It, I mean, the time will come. So Christians are misunderstood. And then he also writes to the dispersion. The Greek word for that is a word that we actually, 
is in English also, diaspora, and it refers usually to Jews, the dispersion of the Jews, the scattering of them. And when Jews think of it, they always, uh, they think of it in terms of they're, they're scattered because they're punished. Christians are also the dispersion, the diaspora, but for a different reason. We are scattered because God scattered them so he could plant churches everywhere and spread the gospel everywhere. He didn't want one place in Jerusalem that everybody would have to come to. So he brought all those people from all over the known world to Jerusalem. They all get saved and they all right back to their place. And now all of a sudden you can't, you can't stamp it out anymore. It's everywhere. Uh, you might think that you live in Taylorville because your parents did. But if you're a Christian, you live where you live so that you might expand God's kingdom. From God's point of view, you think you made that choice, and you did. But God is using that choice. He wants to use that choice for his purposes. Now, I'm not saying God manipulates people against their will or anything like that. But God is God and can use all sorts of things. And he wants the gospel, not just here and there and over there. He wants it everywhere. Amen. And so he put Don and, and Rosie over there, he put Ricky over there, and he put Mark over that way. Just, we're all over that way, that way. We're everywhere for his purpose. Amen. So we have to live that purpose and realize that I'm not just here for me. Well, I'm where I am because of him. Uh, all right, so then, uh, starting in verse 2, Peter starts right off, so we're after one verse in now, or in the second verse, he starts off with like a, a Trinitarian sort of framework. He says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So Peter's saying that nothing happens outside the, the foreknowledge of God the Father. God is never surprised. God is never taken aback. God isn't jumpy. You know, you know I'm jumpy. I get a little squirrely at times because, I mean, like, my mother, whom I, you'll never, ever hear me say a bad word about my mother. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, have you ever heard me say a bad word about my mother? No. No, 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 but. This also happened. This is real. <laughs> my dad was in Canada uh, on a hunting trip, and I wasn't old enough to go. And so mom and I are home. But my sister was already at all that, I think. So I was probably like a fifth grader, possibly a sixth grader. And it's kind of this sort of weather, or this sort of time of year, so it's dark already. And it's mom and me in the house. Dairy Queen wasn't open, so she's home. And I came out in the, I, I don't know, I've been in my room, I come out, and I'm like, hey, Mom. I'm like, no, she's not there. So I'm in the other room. Mom? No. Now I'm getting a little nervous. I checked the third room, and I was more nervous, and the fourth room, and I was more nervous, and the fifth room, and I was more nervous, and every time I said her, my voice got higher. Mom? <laughs> Mom? And so I started looking again where I'd already looked, and I go out in the living room, and I'm like, and I turn around, and she jumps out from behind a chair. I am not exaggerating when I say I was wet, head to toe, instantly with sweat. I, I screamed. I was like, ah, don't ever do that. And I was crying, and she felt bad, but she laughed, too. So maybe that's why I'm jumpy. I don't know. God is not jumpy. He's never, ever, ever caught off guard. Ever. So everything happens, happens with his foreknowledge of it. He knew, you've known people in the past, you might know them now, that are blowhards, and something will happen, they're like, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. No, they didn't. 
Now, it's easy to say once it's done, but they didn't know, but God did. They're everything that ever happens. God, I knew that was going to happen. Called it. Every time, he mm -hmm. knows. Peter is saying that, that is, there's everything done. People are where they are, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Nothing happens outside his knowledge. So, what did Peter say on the day of Pentecost? He preached this great sermon, and they're like, oh, what must we do to be saved? Did he say, well, it depends. First, we have to decide if you're elect or not. <laughs> no, that's nonsense. He never said anything like that. He just said, yeah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved. Okay, so he knew that God knew. So you got God the Father. In the, continuing that verse, in sanctification of the Spirit, um, consecration and cleansing are both part of sanctification. This sanctification is the work of the Spirit. So we have uh, elect according to the foreknowledge of God in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins are forgiven by accepting what Jesus did for us on the cross. So he is, again, I want to read that whole little verse to you now. This is who Peter has written this letter to. And it's a description of who he's written the letter to. It's the pilgrims of the dispersion. And these places come. And now he's describing those pilgrims, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, all three in one. You have God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son. We're going to see different places throughout this book that do that kind of thing, where Peter is making it clear. Remember, Jesus, the first one, or Peter, the first one that said to Jesus, uh, Who do people say I am? Well, some say this, some say this, well, some say this, some say this. Well, who do you say I am? And Peter's like, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Peter, please don't say stuff like that. No, he didn't. He said, You got it. And you didn't see that on your own. God revealed that to you. People that talk nonsense that Jesus never really claimed to be God. But that is people who say it. Nonsense. They've never read the scriptures. The scriptures are clear. Peter knew. He knew then, and he carries it into this. And he's saying, you all, that's who I'm writing this to. So, none of us live in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, or Bithynia. However, are we among the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, in obedience to the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. I'd like to say that we are. Mm -hmm. And if we if we thought we weren't, well, we certainly could remedy that. Mm -hmm. And so being in that group, well, Peter's written this letter to us too. So over the next few months, we're going to see how we can apply what Peter, through the Holy Spirit, wrote to people like us. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word to us tonight. Thank you for uh, a man like Peter who was not afraid to be bold, was not afraid to speak his mind, even when he sometimes got ahead of himself, even when he sometimes couldn't deliver on the things he said. But Lord, you used that man, a man that denied you three times for no more reason than he was afraid of a girl. And yet you forgave him because you knew what he could be. You saw in this man such great potential. And you forgave him because of what kind of a man and what kind of a God you were. And we thank you for that, Lord, because all of us have been done things. All of us have things like we can look at Peter and we can tisk this and shake our heads and say, well, I couldn't believe he did that. But we all have things where we just rather not have that made public. And you forgive us too, Lord, when we come to you. And we thank you for that. 
Help us as we study this letter together to be brought closer to you and to have greater understanding of how we can live in, the, <clears throat> in a world that is at the same time turning against more uh, strongly, more against Christians and you, but at the same time is just more and more desperately in need of you and of the message that we can deliver. Help us to realize that you're going to walk through all of this with us and that you've got us. You've got our back in all of this and you will give us grace to deal with whatever you call us to do. Be with us this evening, Lord, as we go our ways. Pray that you get the new day and night. Help her to feel better. Help her to know that uh, she's missed when she's not here. And just pray that you give her a, a good evening. In Jesus' name. Thank you for being here. Show a hand. How many think there's going to be a big snow?